Hi everyone. Um, so it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Fernanda Canales, who she's from Mexico, and she's an architect, uh, designer, critic, and we are very lucky to have her here and have all her expertise on Mexican architecture and housing. Um, she basic she studied architecture in Ibero. She then did a master's in Barcelona, and then she also has a PhD, and she has published uh, several books, one in about Mexican architecture, and then her other book, which was more recent, is on uh, collective housing in Mexico. Um, so, yes. I'm happy to give the microphone to Fernanda. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. It's a pleasure. And um, I will show briefly my most recent projects, and especially focusing on the theme of housing that we're researching on the different studios this summer. Uh, my practice is based in Mexico City. It ranges from uh, residential client-based projects to institutional work to public commissions, such as this uh, university campus in Monterey, in a city in the north, or small temporary interventions, um, like this, a pavilion for the museum, uh, Tamayo Museum, in a park in Mexico City. And in a way, it challenges or it, try it tries to challenge our understanding the relationship between people, territory, and buildings, sometimes with a more ephemeral or experimental condition, others based uh, in very high dense uh, residential projects in the city, and other times in rural settings, as uh, this house in Estado de México, uh, two hours away from the city. So in a way, it tries to understand different materials, local materials, ways of working, traditional ways of working, and uh, always relating the dwelling with the ideas behind the buildings. Not a, I'm not a interested in architecture as a way of answering questions or solving problems, but rather more of a questioning and trying to change the things, uh, how we live, how are we building our cities, and um, also trying to engage in research. I believe writing is also another way of doing architecture. Um, so I try to spend as much time as possible in archives, in uh, libraries, in uh, the site. I That's why I don't have an office. I believe in a very personal, improvised practice. Uh, these are some uh, uh, images of the recent research I've been doing on housing, the relationship between buildings and the city. Uh, this was shown in the um, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art last year, and they're part of a new book that ACTAR is publishing at the end of this year. So um, in a way, I tried to find out how buildings are linked to cities and how people are linked to um, construction. No? So it's, it's a way of trying to put together bodies and furniture, ideas, theories, history, and uh, cities. And um, of all the images we have of the latest earthquake in Mexico City, this was in September 2017, I think uh, this one is particularly eloquent uh, because for me, it, it relates to the work I try to do. Um, in this image, we can see the very quotidian aspects, the everyday life that happens behind the walls of buildings. Uh, you can even guess the age of the inhabitants, or uh, I mean, you, you can see the um, shoes for their next party, or what was their age or their um, their profession, and. What really uh, is dramatic of this image is that in a way it depicts the um, individual needs, the individual 
desires within the collective consequences. You know, what does it mean to design the lives of other people and how does that um, really impact our lives and the consequences in the lives of others? You know, so uh, in a way, this image portrays the, the main theme of my work that is trying to find um, how to think about the space that lies between a bed and a sidewalk, between a bedroom and the city, between different bedrooms, and between the consequences with the natural resources, with territory, and uh, with conditions that are usually thought of, especially in this case, as an accident or um, something that doesn't have to do with architects, but in, in a way I think it's obviously our responsibility. How do we design the lives of others and what does it mean to uh, place individual needs one besides another, on top of another, besides many others? So um, I will share today eight uh, different projects uh, the, from the last eight years. Uh, this one, they're all related to, to houses in, in different ways. This one, for example, is a transformation of an existing house. This was a commission, it was a competition done by the Ministry of Culture for uh, transforming an existing abandoned house in the south part of the city, of Mexico City, in order to provide an example of, uh, it, it wanted to become a prototype of what to do with abandoned houses in this area. Coyoacan is um, a traditional neighborhood. It used to be for weekend houses on the outskirts of the city 100 years ago, but now is inserted in the central part of the city. The city has grown so much that Coyoacan now is part of a central uh, area. And uh, this neighborhood is usually known as an ungentrifiable neighborhood because regulations have not changed for years. So you have very big houses that used to be weekend houses. For 14 children, nobody has anymore. And regulations don't allow that to change. You cannot uh, build higher. The density cannot be changed. And the uses of the house are still always residential. So in a way, it depicts how cities change uh, faster than regulations, faster than architecture. So you have this condition of Coyoacan being characterized of uh, very, very narrow streets with very tall walls where you can never see what's happening inside. You, you only have amazing private gardens of houses that are mainly empty. And everything that's needed, the, the recent um, programs, are all happening either illegally inside occupied uh, abandoned houses or uh, illegally outside in the streets, such as marketplaces and stores that are uh, happening informally in the sidewalks. So this idea was to change um, the use of the house, make it really public, and uh, providing an alternative so the neighbors wouldn't feel that th it, it was an intrusion. Changing the program of a house to a public space wouldn't mean um, diminishing their privacy or uh, having strangers coming into a residential neighborhood. So um, this, this competition grew in a way out of a contradiction because uh, the, the house had no architectural value. We didn't even know who had been the architect. It was not even registered. Um, but it couldn't be changed because of the historical uh, traditional site where it's setting. So uh, we couldn't change the facade. We couldn't change the window. You couldn't touch the, the aspect of the house. But uh, they wanted to really make visible that now it housed a public cultural center, a library, a bookshop, an auditorium. So how can you open up something that you are not allowed to touch? So that was really like um, the difficult part of the, of the project. These are the images of the existing house. Uh, and the first uh, strategy of the competition was to take out the wall um, avoiding this very closed, narrow streets and making really open, uh, in a way, trying to extend the sidewalk inside of the building and taking also the building outside, having this 
uh, transitions or thresholds wider between the trees that are inside that are always enclosed and the outside space that never is allowed to, to show that richness that occurs in the inside. So um, the, the house is in a plot of 1,000 square meters and it's sitting completely in half of the, of the site with uh, all of the exterior space was just residual area. It was for parking spaces. It had been intervened in the past with il illegal adaptations um, and it had nothing, it was just parking space in the front and then storage areas all in the back. So the, the project comprises uh, very um, two strategies. One that's to make visible the, the public new condition, how to take the books outside. In a, in a way, this project is an attempt to uh, design a library for people that have never read a book or maybe don't even know how to read, uh, that never feel invited into public spaces. They, I mean, you always feel you have to enter with an ID or an invitation or pay a ticket. So the idea here was that everybody would feel welcome and that it would be really visible that everybody could come in without having any um, anything was needed, not even reading, and you would feel the um, proximity with the books. So how to take the books outside of a house that cannot change the side the sizes of its windows. So the idea was to frame the house, to build a very big foyer, triple height frame foyer in the outside in order to extend the books and take the books outside to the street and also to try to um, come with the sidewalk and um, enter the house. Also bringing the trees inside of the house, making a connection between the existing vegetation and uh, providing the what w was residual spaces in the um, perimeter of the house, making those part of a new garden. So you can see in this image how the old structure connects with the new frontal foyer and how the sidewalk completely blurs and becomes part of the building. There are several patios and several uh, um, ceiling uh, perforations in order to have natural light inside. So there's, you never know when the tree is next to you and it's inside or is actually outside. You have these transitions between the new program so the house would always be um, uh, always be penetrated with a series of patios and also with the idea of fluidity of the space. You have an auditorium on the back, three different patios uh, and the modern services, workshops, offices, storage facilities and the bookshop in the front. And uh, you never know when it begins and when it stops. In a way, it becomes part of the street. And it also incorporates the accidents or the, um, the conditions, existing conditions of the site, like the color of the leaves or the existing vegetation, even the vegetation on the garden on the side, the house it's sitting beside, that always was a very enclosed space, but in a way we try to bring that also inside of the project. And uh, having double height and triple height spaces in the inside, always with natural light. So there's a play between the existing subdivided house and then the new proportions of uh, well laid spaces. And also taking the um, traditional aspects of the existing house like the stairs and providing different outdoor spaces with a series of patios in order to house a cafeteria, spaces for reading outside, a small open theater, and changing the life of the city, connecting it, as I said, with the garden that's just on one side and th that was never part of uh, this public condition of the city. And after doing that uh, project, uh, I was called by the same Ministry of Culture, in this case also with a link with the Ministry of Housing, with the in Fornavit, um, because they had a very big problem of abandoned houses in all of Mexico, especially the housing projects that were the big housing estate projects that were built in the 70s and 80s. 
and Mexico has a, a very big problem of abandoned houses. And in this case, they wanted to uh, donate um, 1,000 books and place them in as a prototype in in one of the abandoned apartments, transform an abandoned apartment into a reading room, making it uh, public and having the book so everybody could go in. But when I was called to the, this project, I was really scared that who was going to be in charge of the space that was going to be shot inside one apartment, one in each of these. Uh, they have uh, many housing estates with the same condition where nobody was going to be able to hear or see what was happening inside the space, and there was not going to be anybody actually in charge. So um, I said, we, we cannot do that. It has to really be public. As in the project in Coyoacán, you really have to see what's happening. People have to be in direct contact with the books. Again, providing a space to read for people that don't have books, don't even know how to read, but how can they become also part of the project? So I went with them and I said, we have to find a public space in this housing states and make it outside. It has to become part of the public life of the complex. And the response was as usual, it's we don't have any money, we don't have any other space, we just have 1,000 books and the money just to paint the existing apartment, take out the kitchen, remodeling and placing uh, some chairs and just some bookshelves. So uh, when I visited the, the, um, several of these housing states, the, um, they always shared the same condition. They had been um, illegally occupied and privatized and abandoned at the same time. So public space has become in many areas this. This image is really uh, common where people have to cage their cars because of insecurity um, situations, but they, they actually don't even have a car, so they become storage spaces, um, spaces that have been illegally occupied, that were to be public areas, and that now are just uh, places to store mainly trash. And, and I mean, you can feel how unsafe you would be to walk during the night or at any time because they have become completely abandoned the spaces. So I went back with them and I said, I mean, you do have space. Uh, it has been illegally occupied, but we can reclaim that space and we can use the money you have just to paint the apartment and to do a very small remodeling job. We can use that money to provide and reclaim even just one of these car spaces. So uh, I said, let's do an experiment. Let's just take 2.5 times 5 square meters, just the space of a single car, and put the books inside and make that really visible, just with the m basic elements. And if this works out, we can put two cars together, or three, or you can place them vertically with uh, just four uh, simple elements, just using um, four walls, one rooftop, uh, it could even be uh, self-built, and you can place them in order to uh, do some even patios or outside spaces that would be able to provide um, future public space. And uh, it's a project that's thought to be, I mean, nothing can be broken, nothing, there's no glass, but we took the, the typical um, concrete blocks we just tilted them in order to have this lattice work that provides always open cross air ventilation. You can always hear what's happening inside. You can always see. And, and then every material is just from the local hardware store where you can uh, buy anything and replace anything really easily and really cheap. So it's just three materials basically. And they have become the lights of these areas the safe, the only safe public space where you can always see what's happening. And uh, we have built almost 15 of these uh, reading rooms in different states. There's one in Tijuana, one in Oaxaca, Chiapas, Nayarit, Oaxaca, and um, many other places. The idea is to build one in each state in Mexico. Mexico has 32 states. So uh, they become an example of how 
can we transform these existing housing states with very, very simple elements, very cheap materials. And actually they, they have become, they have helped change the whole uh, areas. Um, just by reclaiming one parking space, people have recognized the importance that this area belonged to them. It wasn't meant to be a privatized uh, cell or cage for an unused or broken car or old refrigerator or whatever that they placed inside. So it has really changed how with just a single structure, it's the only area that has shade. It's the only place where you could sit down. So now the, they're starting even to extend that condition to the outside. And now they're not just places to read. They're also uh, the places where baptisms occur, marriages, or where people have uh, different lessons. And uh, we have changed the prototype depending on the, on the geographical climate and territorial condition, but also in the particular needs of the community. So the community builds, um, self-builds the project. Some need um, to store trash, some find a way to buy two computers, some uh, find like different furniture. So it has become a project that has adapted uh, during the years. And it's always thought to, they can be flooded. For example, the bookshelves just begun uh, like one uh, meter 20 in the up because they're always placed in these um, very strange conditions of uh, the constructions that shouldn't be in the places where they were uh, built. So the rain can go in, water, flooding, sun, it's thought for, um, radical weather conditions and for no maintenance at all. Um, now I'm showing a house that has in a way also the, the same ideas. Uh, this is a prototype for social housing and um, it's built in Hidalgo, in Apan, but it was also thought as a prototype that could change depending on the area and the geographical climate conditions. It's um, a unit of uh, minimum housing, a 32 square meters, so it's just four times eight. And the idea is that you can sum up different volumes. The first one housing the minimum services just for one bed, but having a tapanco, which is a traditional double height space, so you can also use the upper area for uh, working or having a, the baby sleeping there, having a bathroom on the lower floor, and you can uh, add up, as in the reading rooms, you can keep on um, summing up the different parts and changing the program to two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and also adapting to the local conditions. Because uh, in many rural areas in Mexico, people still cook outside. They don't have inside kitchens with stoves, so they just uh, use wooden uh, traditional um, cooking methods and like to cook outside or some like the bathrooms to be outside, not inside the house. So it's a prototype that can really change in these different configurations. And um, you can also switch the relationship between one module and the other in order to provide a patio in the middle or having a patio also that provides private space within the same structure, within those 32 square meters. So here you can see how the double height space, this was a solution that was thought uh, because the need of providing, um, of storing the water, the rainwater. So you have um, an area that's double height in order to um, store rainwater and it's directly placed on top of the bathroom and the kitchen. So it's, it's the most efficient solution so that anybody could have uh, water. And then you get the double height in the living room or the dining room, whatever space you want to provide with more um, amplitude. And the idea is that they can conform a community, they can become, uh, even house different programs, uh, working space, space for storing crops, and for people who work in their own house. So uh, the first prototype was just recently uh, concluded in Apan Hidalgo, and it, it has, it's done with the two models, but as I said, the space between 
those two volumes can change and can actually become a larger patio where you can eat outside or do um, workshops or whatever uh, whatever the, the personal needs are. And they have a small patio in one of them. And despite being um, very, very, very small and very cheap, this costs uh, around 8,000 pounds to build each of the modules. So uh, despite the um, r size, you always have a double height area. You have natural light in both sides. You have natural light coming from the top. And um, it's in a way almost, um, I mean, you have the store rainwater. So it's, it's really cheap also for uh, future maintenance and future uses. And it has uh, small patios in order to, I mean, people are still in Mexico, we dry our clothes outside mainly. So it has also become part of our landscape is uh, you see all these clothing lines and, and people don't want to show um, that private um, condition to the neighbors or to the outside, you know, uh, having everybody seeing your underwear. So uh, how to provide that uh, traditional uh, costume with uh, sense of privacy. And this is the space that can go wider. I mean, usually these projects are built in rural areas or even in illegally occupied spaces where land doesn't represent the cost, but what does represent the cost is the, the volumes and the construction. So you can have a house that can open up and be twice as large or three times as large just because of the space that's left in between one volume and the other. And actually, most of the, the life occurs in that outer space. And now going to the opposite uh, with urban settings, very dense commercial uh, developers or real estate uh, standard uh, housing projects. This uh, is a building of 12 uh, apartments in central area in Mexico City, in Colonia Portales, which is one of the most um, densely populated uh, neighborhoods. And the idea was to provide a small difference between each apartment, even though it needed to be built very cheap and very fast and identical in, in that sense, just um, trying to make small changes to provide from one bedroom to two or three, or from a duplex solution of apartments on the top, using the rooftop, making small um, balconies and terraces in order to have more space than is usually available for uh, developers in these areas with that uh, budget. So the idea was that every apartment has a possibility of extending into an outside space. And also the corridors are always open. We have a very good climate in Mexico that we n usually never, or, or sometimes we, we don't take advantage of that because we copy the architectural solutions from uh, international references that they're always shut off and they're always closed, but actually uh, we can live uh, in outside space almost year round. So the project uses the corridors as a way of extending the areas into patios, balconies, or terraces in different ways. Sometimes they're really, really small. As I said, it's a, it's a project that's really economic. In a way, we could speak about the streets in the air that we had been talking about. Uh, these are now not streets in the air, but, but yes, terraces or corridors that become public space, a place where children could play, you can have your bike, your stroller, the areas that usually new apartments are not uh, providing. And also, I mean, you won't get wet, but you do have a way of extending the dwellings in the outside, each in different ways. In the terrace, it's a, a wider space, and you have the duplex apartments and the top floor. And despite being the, the patios between these two volumes being very narrow, you always have switched, I mean, the, the views are never direct in order to maintain the privacy 
of the inhabitants. And uh, now I'm going to show two houses, uh, completely different scale. These are for weekend houses in a uh, rural setting, two hours away from Mexico City. Um, it's it's uh, in, in a way, I think of this project as the same logic as Casa Productiva, the, the module that could be added up. In this case, it's for a single family, but